So recently, I have begun covering secrets that you may not know from the various Pokemon games. I started with Scarlet and Violet, and then decided to try a video on the Kanto games, with the potential to do videos on the other regions if that video did well. Well, you guys really showed a lot of support to that video, which I really appreciate, so thank you, and because of that, I'm gonna go ahead and do another one of those videos, this time for the Johto region. As always, if this video does well, I would love to continue this series, so if you want to see more, be sure to leave a like and a comment, and with that said, let's go ahead and check out some Pokemon secrets that you may not know from the Johto games. Let's start off with one that is equal parts cool and mind-blowing. So, obviously, in the Johto games, you get to explore both Kanto and Johto, and the stories of these regions' respective games connect directly to one another as well, as Gold and Silver are essentially sequels to Red and Blue. Something pretty mind-blowing that is going on with the connection between these two regions is that their cities and towns are pretty much all named after colors. With that said, the first town that you ever see between these two regions is Pallet Town in Red and Blue, which in Japanese, as well as multiple other languages, is partially named after the color white. Meanwhile, the last city you come to between these two regions is Blackthorn City in Gold and Silver, meaning that you begin with white and end with black. Furthermore, white is the absence of color, while black is the absorption of all colors, and in between these two towns sit several cities named after colors, as previously mentioned, that you meet along the way, effectively meaning that the names of these towns, Pallet and Blackthorn, represent the experience of your adventure in Kanto and Johto, where you begin in the pure white Pallet Town, and then, after traveling through all these colors, color-based locations end up in Blackthorn City, whose namesake is the result of all the different colors of the towns you just visited being absorbed and coming together. I have no way of being able to say whether or not this was intentional by the developers, but intentional or not, it's a pretty amazing way to represent the connected adventure between Kanto and Johto. Another really cool thing about the themes of Johto is that the theme of time that is present in these games played a huge part in the kind of Pokémon that were introduced here. The day and night cycle that was introduced in the Johto games and the theme of time, or times of the day, is plastered all over Johto's Pokémon, even though it doesn't really announce itself and therefore can be easy to miss. For example, you do have some obvious ones like Espeon and Umbreon, who evolve during the day and night, but then you also have Pokémon like Cleffa and Igglybuff, who evolve with a Moonstone, Blossom and Sunflora, who evolve with the help of a Sunstone. You also have distinctly night-themed Pokémon like Hoot Hoot and Spinarak, who only appear at night as well, and distinctly morning-themed Pokémon like Lediba, who is the brighter, cheerier character counterpart of the night-based Spinarak. And even Miltank can fall into this as well, as cows are commonly milked very early in the morning, and in Pokémon Crystal, Miltank can only be found in the wild during the morning and day. You even have Celebi as well, who obviously has the literal ability of time travel, so this was actually a huge focus of Johto's Pokémon, even though it can be easy to not notice. Next, let's go ahead and rattle off a few secrets that are a bit quicker to discuss. First, in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, your rival Silver actually received a bit of a redesign that did not make the final games, as evidenced by this early sprite. His final design is pretty similar to his original one, just with a few touch-ups, while this early design gives him a new outfit that is fairly different, as well as a hairstyle that is actually more similar to his original design than his final one. This next one isn't technically Johto themed, but it does appear in the Johto games, so I decided to allow it because it's kind of hilarious. 
It's short, sweet, and to the point, but Lieutenant Serge's name in German and French is actually Major Bob, and I thought that was pretty funny and worth a mention, and since Major Bob is present in the Johto games, I thought it would be cool to bring up. Curse is a move introduced in Generation 2, which is pretty iconic, as it's well known for its effect of cutting the user's HP in order to put a curse on the opponent, which gradually decreases their HP. For as iconic as this move is though, you might not know that it is actually the leftovers of a Pokemon that was cut from the games. Norowara is a Pokemon based on a voodoo doll that was discovered in the 1997 Nintendo Space World demo of Pokemon Gold and Silver, but was obviously cut from the final games. However, during this time it had a signature move known as Nail Down, and this move ultimately became Curse, meaning that Curse was once the signature move of a cut Pokemon, which is pretty stinking cool in my opinion. This also helps to explain why the animation of Curse in various games involves a nail being driven into the user. This isn't even the only move in the final games that this occurs with though, as the move Heal Bell was also the signature move of a Pokemon that didn't even make the game. Courtesy of The Cutting Room Floor, who have compiled a lot of the cut content info in this video, so big shout out to them, the Bell Cat Pokemon Rin Rin and Berurun were going to have Hill Bell as their own signature move before they were scrapped. And this can even be seen in an early sprite of Hill Bell's animation, which uses a Sleigh Bell, matching that of the two cat Pokemon. A sleigh bell has also been used in the move's animation since then as well, possibly as another callback to the cut Pokemon that the move was originally intended for. Pokemon Gold and Silver have been known to be a gold mine of cut content for years now, but something that doesn't seem to get talked about too often is that it seems that the old Chateau from Pokemon Diamond and Pearl was originally meant to appear within Gold and Silver. This is because within the data of the games are a number of unused location names that were meant to be displayed on the game's map, in order to properly label where you might be at any given time. One of these unused names is called Haunted House in Japanese, and given that a large amount of Gold and Silver's cut content ended up being used in Diamond and Pearl, such as Pokemon, locations, and more, it's likely that this also applies to the old chateau as well, and it was meant to originally be present in the Johto games instead of the Sinnoh games. Another fascinating thing from the cut content of Gold and Silver that has to do with the Sinnoh games involves Agatha. It's long been discussed how Agatha and the Sinnoh Elite Four member Bertha share a striking resemblance to one another, and it was even confirmed that they are related in some way when the character Charm was introduced in Legends Arceus that appears to be an ancestor to both of them. However, this connection and its roots might date back even farther than that, and could possibly have been in the works as far back as Pokemon Gold and Silver. You see, while Agatha does not appear in the final Gold and Silver games, in the leaked Space World demo, she can be found inside of a house in a town known as Blue Forest. What's really interesting about this is that Blue Forest is one of two cities from this demo that can very clearly be seen, due to their strikingly similar layouts, as an early predecessor to Snowpoint City in Sinnoh, meaning that Agatha, at this point, was present in a town that was ultimately reworked into the Sinnoh games, with her relative Bertha also coming from the Sinnoh games as well. Given this, it seems possible that Bertha's existence, or the connection between her and Agatha, could have something to do with whatever was initially planned for Agatha in this version of Gold and Silver, and that whole storyline could, in some way shape or form, date all the way back to Generation 2. 
Another Elite Four member in Kanto that doesn't appear in Gold and Silver is Lorelei. However, it doesn't seem like this was always planned to be the case. Lorelei was present as an Elite Four member in the 1997 demo of the games, and later in the also leaked 1999 demo, a new sprite of Lorelei can be found being used as a placeholder for what would ultimately become Karen. And this sprite of Lorelei is extremely similar to the one of Karen found in the final games. This seems to mean that Karen's design was more or less based and built off of Lorelei's, which is not only fascinating, but would also explain why Karen received a pretty significant redesign in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, presumably in order to make her more of her own character. Meanwhile, there is also something that's pretty interesting in these games that has to do with Goldenrod City, as this area seems to have a strong connection to bikes. Not only is this the location of the bike shop in Johto, but the bike theme in the Johto games is just a sped up version of Goldenrod City's theme. However, that's not where this story ends, because right next door, at the National Park, the theme of the bug catching contest that is held here is also a remixed version of the Kanto bike theme, which is a pretty interesting theme for the music of this area. <laughs> There's also another really cool tidbit that comes out of this area as well, as the gym leader of Goldenrod City, Whitney, who is the third gym leader you face, is actually listed internally and is seen in the various leaked demos of the games as the second gym leader instead of the third, with Bugsy taking her place in that third spot. This is likely the reason why the bug catching contest takes place right outside of Goldenrod City, as it was Bugsy who was originally going to be the gym leader in this area instead of Whitney. Speaking of bugs, Ledian was a new bug type Pokemon introduced in these games, and it is known as the 5 star Pokemon. This might seem kind of odd, however, as there are no stars to be had anywhere on Ledian. However, this is ultimately due to the fact that Ledian's category is a leftover from its beta days, where its beta design actually did have stars on its back like its category would suggest. A favorite Johto secret of mine comes right when you start up the game in New Bark Town. As you may know, pretty much every town in Pokemon has a slogan, and New Bark Town's slogan is, the town where winds of a new beginning blow. The map description of New Bark Town also mentions the wind as well, and in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, windmills were added next to every building as a subtle nod to this, which is a great attention to detail. In the video I did on Secrets from the Kanto games, I talked about some little-known artwork from the Gen 1 era that a lot of people probably hadn't seen, because I am a huge appreciator of Pokemon artwork, and I love seeing the older artwork in particular, as not only is it cool, but it's not as available as the artwork from the modern games, hence why many haven't seen it. Well, this is also the case for the Gen 2 games, as there is a lot of official Gen 2 artwork, particularly of some of the characters and gym leaders, that a lot of people probably haven't seen, and I want to give it a spotlight here because I think it looks amazing. I believe that some of this art has also been made available in restored quality, thanks in part to Lutu. They've got a bigger Pokemon art project they've been working on lately doing this kind of stuff, which is amazing, so a big shout out goes to Lutu for that, you can check him out on Twitter and YouTube if you would like, and a big shout out to everyone else who is involved in bringing this kind of art back to life. 
Another thing I have talked about in a previous video is how Azumarill, in one of its beta iterations, was a golden color instead of blue, and this ended up becoming Azumarill's shiny color in the final games, meaning that it was likely carried over from its beta design. Well, that interesting fact has an added piece to it, as the shiny version of its pre-evolution Meryl during its beta days was blue, which is its standard color in its final design, while the standard version in its beta form was colored pink instead. This likely means that just like how Azumarill's shiny came from the color of its beta design, Meryl's coloration likely came from its shiny beta design, making for an interesting shared trait amongst this family of Pokémon. So obviously when it comes to that infamous beta demo of Gold and Silver that I've already brought up a couple times, it was very different to the final games and shows how the final games could have been very different if things had shaken out differently. Well, what might have not been as apparent when all of this info was coming out at first was how close this demo truly was to being the actual game. As previously mentioned, this demo originates from the Nintendo Space World Show in 1997, which more specifically was held in November of 1997. According to Bulbapedia, the game's release date was announced at this show to be coming in March of 1998, which was a mere four months later at the time. This means that the way we see the game in this demo, with all of its Pokémon, its entirely different region, and completely different story, was pretty much how the game was planned to be released, because if they were planning a release date for four months later after this demo was shown, any further development on the games that they were planning to do after that would have obviously been pretty minor. This release date did eventually get delayed, however, so that all the changes we see in the final games could be made, but we were literally a matter of months away from getting an entirely different Pokémon Gold and Silver, which would have changed Pokémon history forever, and that, in my opinion, is pretty wild. Later on, after many of these changes were made though, came the 1999 Space World demo of the games. This demo shows a version of the game that is much closer to the final product, but there are still some fun differences and bits of cut content in it, like the fact that the Pokeball crafter Kurt was likely intended to be battled at some point. Kurt can only ever be talked to in the final games, but within this demo, a polished battle sprite of him can be found, along with the unused trainer class known as Ballsmith, which is something that pretty much can only apply to Kurt. As Kurt is a fairly important character in the Johto games, it would be interesting to know what context this possible battle was meant to be fought in, and if it would have had any impact on the overall story of the games. Speaking of what was originally planned for these games' story, while it's not known in a lot of detail what the story of Gold and Silver was going to be during the time in 1997 when the game was so much different, the intro to the story can actually be gleaned from the demo, and along with all of the other information that the demo gives us, the original story of Gold and Silver was likely not only going to be very different, but also very intriguing as well. Thanks to various text that is present within the demo, we know that the gist of the early game story is that Professor Oak has come to this new region to study all of the new Pokémon that have been discovered here, but apparently he didn't tell anybody where he was going because reports are circulating from Kanto that Professor Oak has gone missing. When we combine this with the fact that there is also a sprite of an imposter oak character that is present within the demo, it seems like at least part of the story was going to revolve around Professor Oak being missing, and the evil team or villains of this game were going to use this to their advantage by impersonating Professor Oak to try and accomplish whatever it is they wanted to do. 
It's really hard to infer how all of this would have actually fit together and how it would have actually played out, but it does seem like the story might have been heading in that direction, which would have been really intriguing to play through because, in my opinion, it sounds like a super interesting premise. While changes came to the overarching story of the games, there were even edits to the final story that we did actually see as well. Within the data of Gold and Silver is unused text that states that someone's daughter has gone missing in the Burned Tower, seemingly implying the presence of a side quest where the player would have to go find the daughter in the Burned Tower and bring her back safely. This never appeared in the final games, obviously, but was likely repurposed for the very similar quest involving the missing granddaughter on the SS Aqua when you're on your way to Kanto, revealing yet another thing from these games that originally had a much different purpose than what it was used for in the final product. Speaking of the Burned Tower, within the final versions of Gold and Silver, there is some unused data present for a static encounter with a level 40 Entei within the Burned Tower. In the final games, all of the beasts are obviously roaming Pokémon, so this data could have been from a time when they were meant to be static encounters instead, and were each presumably found in a specific location like the Burned Tower. Just like the Burned Tower, however, I've also got another anecdote to share about the SS Aqua as well, and what could have possibly been planned for it originally. As the Cutting Room Floor mentioned on their website, Pokémon Gold and Silver have a list of environment types that determine what you can do in any given area, like whether or not you can use Fly there, and whether or not you can see the different times of day. There are several different kinds of environment types, but one of them goes unused. This unused environment type is referred to in the games as PIMG underscore ship, which naturally suggests that it would have been used on a ship of some kind. It also allows for the different times of day to be visible as well, meaning that it was likely intended for a ship deck type of area, like we saw with the SSN in Gen 1. This most likely means that either the SS Aqua was going to have an outdoor deck area that got cut, or this was going to be on a different boat that did have a deck, like possibly the SSN itself. This means it's also possible, if only ever so slightly, that the SSN could have been planned to be rideable in the games, either in addition to, or in place of, the SS Aqua. Obviously, what people love the most from batches of cut content like this are the cut Pokémon, and there were a bunch revealed from the Gold and Silver demos. However, there were some that haven't hardly been touched on for one reason or another. Like, for instance, a cut Girafferig evolution. Before Ferrigaraff was a thing, people were dying for a Girafferig evolution, and one was actually planned right away for Gold and Silver. It only has data associated with it that we know about currently, so there's no sprite available or anything like that, but we do know some info about it, such as the fact that it was planned to evolve from Giraffe Rig at level 34, and was interestingly a ghost normal type. It was also present in the games up until just about four months before they were released, according to data from the various leaks that we've seen, which means that its inclusion was under consideration until pretty much the last second. And in the same situation as the cut Giraffe Rig evolution, there was also a cut Shuckle evolution that was planned as well. Yes, Shuckle was going to have an evolution originally. Just like the Girafferig evolution, there is nothing other than data available for it, and it was cut around the same time, meaning that it was under consideration really late into development, but we do know that it was planned to be a rock ground type, and that it was going to evolve from Shuckle at level 22. In the same way that Pokémon sometimes get cut though, human characters also get cut from Pokémon games too, 
and there are actually a pretty good amount of trainer classes from Gold and Silver that never made the final games. These include the Fledgling, Male Teacher, Sportsman, and Soldier trainer classes. The differences from the demo era of Gold and Silver even extend to type matchups as well, as these games of course introduced the Dark and Steel types, and therefore had the opportunity to be different compared to the final games. Weirdly enough, Dark was originally weak to normal and dark type moves at this stage, and the steel type was not weak to fire and was instead weak to water and electric type moves instead. While balancing all of this out and changes being made to something like this is obviously inevitable, these do seem like some interesting starting points for these types, to say the least. And with that said, those were 25 Johto secrets that you may have not known about. Be sure to let me know all of your thoughts on these in the comments below, leave a like if you enjoyed, and if you want to see more videos like this for the other games and regions. Be sure to subscribe if you're new as well, and with that said, I will be back very soon with another video. Until then, as always, thank you guys so much for watching this one, I really appreciate it, and I will smell you guys later.